This is Geek Gab with your host, Dornall and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back, Geek Gab, for Saturday, April 13th, 2019. We, uh, man, dang it. I've had a rough morning, guys. I was supposed to have something interesting and fast and fun to say right after my introduction. And as soon as I got done with all the usual busy work, literally just looking in the upper right-hand corner of my computer to see what the date was, and then pausing for but a nanosecond to really make sure I nail down the correct year before we go. And right after all that was done, my brain just said to me, oh, that's enough. Bam. Everything I might have said is just it gone. It just gone out of my head. Uh, Dornall, I'm going to tag you in an emergency. I need, I need help here, man. Hey, hey man, I, I've got lots of uh, different responses here that I could go with, so I'm just going to go with them all. Uh, let's go with the, uh, you know, you they've got these programs on computers where you can take notes, and you can just have your notes and scripts ahead of time so you don't forget that stuff. We'll go with that one. Notes, scripts. Notes. Are you telling me that this show is not scripted? <laughs> we do not carefully plot and plan every quip and bon mot that, that we can get on the air and thrill our audience to pieces? I we think we should that. do that. I think we should do that. I, I think we should have a special episode of the Geek Cab where we actually write jokes and script a few things and see if anybody notices. I'd be willing to try that, but I, I don't... I, I, I think that's going to would probably turn out pretty terrible. That's just my guess. Uh, well, we were actually too busy to 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 plan out your opening script and everything uh, in the green room. We were hanging out with our uh, wonderful guest, uh, author John C. Wright. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, gentlemen. I do have some some cool news for this week, uh, and and we'll I'll go into detail next show. Uh, but I've got something cool going on today. Awesome. Mysterious, vague, and ominous. Um, yes, I, yeah, that was a setup for you to ask what it is, but I'll I'll accept your all caps. Uh, oh, the the way there. in which you phrased your introduction led me to suspect that you intended to elucidate more next week. Do you have <laughs> further information that yeah, you this want is to impart to our audience today? Yeah, it's no secret. This is this is going to be this is going to be cool. Um, I, I wish I'd known about it uh, in advance so I could fly all of my cool geek gab buddies up for it. But a f local friend of mine is hosting a film festival in downtown Seattle today. It's called the Bone Bat Comedy of Horrors Film Fest. Awesome. <laughs> So, uh, and this is great. Uh, I got my father's visiting in town. We're going to head down to Seattle. We're going to go to a theater and it's running from like 1 p.m. to midnight. And it's going to be back to back, like P uh, independent horror shorts. And uh, and it, the, the theme is comedy of horror. So it's, it's going to be funny horror stuff. And they've got live music. Uh, as intermissions and, and, and stuff. It's going to be a wild ride. So I'll, I'll tell you guys all about it next That's time. Great. That sounds like a hell of a good afternoon, man. This is going to be awesome. I, I want to point out, just in case the audience didn't notice, that prior to uh, asking you about that, that I was, in point of fact, in full John C. Wright vocabulary mode. I don't know if you noticed that. It's funny that you say that, because I decided to adopt the Daddy War Pig method of talking for the rest of my life. That's I think it. it'll be great, and I'll be back! <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's great because you can you can you can say the best voice winning out over the weak voices. You, that's perfect because then you can save your your vocabulary, the John C. Wright stuff for your writing, and then just speak. At your oh, your family would love that. <laughs> I bet they would love that even more as a DM. My family, <laughs> as sesquipedalian and as elusive as I am. So they had better. I, I I check the vocabulary every week, and if they don't, if they haven't learned at least two new words in that week, then I I put them in the pit. Well, that's why you have to come at that's that's terrifying, by the way. What the but pit? The, yes, <laughs> the vocabulary pit. 
Uh, sorry, sorry, little Billy, you spelled that wrong. You get 15 oh, no, minutes no, in the pit. No, 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 no. If it was spelling, I'd be in the pit all my life. Have you seen any of my blog or any of my books? <laughs> my spelling, <laughs> you probably, yeah. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. But my vocab, my spoken vocabulary is just, is just. Uh, I, I learned from a young age that if you don't know a word and you look it up, then and you use it three times a day correctly in a sentence, then the word becomes yours. And it's like having a, a nice new friend, nice new pal, come and live in your brain forever. And so yeah. I, when I was young, I read I read H.P. Lovecraft and Jack Vance and other people who had rather erudite vocabularies. And so I learned all sorts of useful words like uh, hippocephalic, you know, bird, uh, horse headed. <laughs> That's a <lovely laughs> word. Eldrick. You can't you can't go a, a fortnight without using the word like Eldrick. It's extremely useful. Well, it, it, good news that your typical uh, typical nerdy gamer such as myself uh, uses or reads Eldrick probably three times a day. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there was at least three games I can think of in the past six months that had that in their description. I, I want to say this, though. Lest our audience is appalled at uh, John C. Wright putting his kids in the pit, you got to realize that the punishment pit in the Wright household has video games and TV but no books. And so that is that is hard time in the right household. So it's actually the other way around. We we actually my uh, uh, we actually have to twist our, our kids' arms to get them to read. Oh really? It's sad. Well, they they were they were born with some uh, reading uh, a dyslexia kind of difficulties, so they have um, to read, uh, you know certain things. But but I should not talk about my kids on the on the internet because you never know who's the same. Are crazy people. I'm very hesitant. I have a plethora of nieces and nephews, and I'm very hesitant to say much of anything about them online because I love them so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if I, anybody hurt them, I, I would be very, very, very displeased. Uh, sh shout out to the guys in, in the chat. Uh, I think a friend of the show, Ben Wheeler, points out that they deserve it. I, I assume he's t referring to your uh, your family. I am sending my kids to go put the pain on Ben Wheeler for saying that. You're you're in trouble now, Ben. Oh, um, wow. Have you heard my short story, Peter Power Armor, about about power armor for children? No. No, it, no it's 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 for real. The, the army's developed it, and so any any day now, we're going to have uh, uh, teenagers and six year olds with uh, uh, chain guns and uh, uh, light anti tank rockets uh, with jet system <laughs> super leaps going from house to house laying down the fire on the on the infidel and it will just be a wonderful world to live in and people said trump wouldn't make anime real <laughs> we got a space force now no, I, mean, that's great. Kidding? I i was reluctant to be a pro trump at first i i there were other candidates i far preferred but he has so far exceeded every possible expectation he's the only politician right or left in my lifetime who has kept his campaign promises just think of how strange it is to say that in a democracy. Yeah, and, and one guy I know who tries to actually honestly tries to keep his campaign promises. I, I I sort of feel the same way. It and it's not so much about the campaign promises, but that it's is the substance of them and, and what they are. You know, as as established before the show, I I'm pretty much a troll on on the internet. But uh, and he's number one troll. But then he started saying and doing the things that are sort of seem like common sense things that. You would like you know that his his populist message yeah. that would have he would have been at home in the Democratic Party seventy years ago or something like that. It's it's you go wait a minute what's what's happening here? Not so but, long ago as that they 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 the Democrat Party were were fairly sane even though they had differences of opinion as to the role of government versus the role of private industry up until quite recently and then they took a sharp hard turn and they abandoned what I will call the liberal wing of the Democrats, and they embrace the left-wing wing of the Democrats. And there's between a liberal and a leftist is, a liberal is willing to fight for your right to for, to speak freely. He might disagree with what you say, but he'll defend your right to say it. Whereas a leftist will not. A leftist will put on a black mask and and, and uh, try to harass or harm you if you say things that are uh, that he regards as anathema. So, <clears throat> you see the difference between the two? They're not the same group. They're not the same group. They're not, it's, not your, it's not your daddy's Democrat party. Speaking of modern uh, news, did you see the photograph this week? Not only did I see the photograph, but I posted it on my blog with the caption that that is a picture of a character from a book of mine. 
because they, what they did is they took a composite uh, uh, data produced photograph of the accretion disk surrounding the supermassive black hole in the middle of Messier 87, which is a, which is a galaxy in the supergalactic cluster in Virgo that has an enormous uh, jet of uh, hard particles and x-rays reaching out into space for thousands and thousands of light years. And it was a, <laughs> it's actually a character in, in my book, Count to Infinity. It's, it's, a, it's a creature called the, the Virgin, the, uh, the Maiden. And uh, uh, that spot is actually a scene where my, my hero, Menelaus Montrose, goes to confront a, uh, uh, a super being who is the composite mind of all the intelligent planets and stars of the, uh, of the Messier 87 galaxy. And so wait, the, that actual... The galactic, the, hole the, center is her, the galactic hole at the center is, is the, her power core, her, 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 her throne room. The, the, the surface effects, mind you, because you can't get anything out of a black hole except for Hawking radiation. That, that so, specific actual black hole was a character in your book? No, not the black hole. The black hole is only an energy source. The, the, uh, uh, the source phenomenon of the black hole, the accretion disk in the, in the surrounding areas. However, it worked. It was that black hole. It was that one. Yes, it was that specific one. That's the one they took a, a snapshot of. Now, I was told by a uh, by a uh, eagle-eyed uh, um, uh, reader of mine that that's not actually a photograph. Photograph. It's a, it's a composite made of uh, astronomical radio data. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a cobbled together image, but it's it's the it's it's an image of the heat pattern that surrounds a, the uh, accretion disk of a black hole. The accretion disk is caused by the infalling particles are agitated against each other because of the tidal stresses on the particles and they give off they give off heat and x-rays and other other things not friendly to uh, human life yep so it's actually seen from my book <laughs> so that's cool i i have i have a fondness and an infection for stars and planets and uh, periods of time and anything else i've ever i've ever stuck a scene in or a character in because of course i study them i'm a big fan of tillamook oregon only because I, I <laughs> use it as the hometown for one of my characters. I'm a big fan of uh, Iota Draconis and of uh, uh, Alpha Camelopardus. Those are both favorite stars of mine. So That's a lot of fun. Have you actually been to Tillamook before? No, 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 I, I, don't, uh, I don't travel. Oh, I'm sorry. Till, Tillamook's actually a lovely place. I was there a couple of years ago. You should go. I've never been to Tillamook, but I've had a lot of their cheese. There you go. Uh, it's it, it's basically a big dairy co-op. You can just go there, and 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 this is way less interesting than than stars and and black holes and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that. All, all. <laughs> I, I use the phrase "land of cheese" when my main character is describing his hometown. Being, <laughs> it's being it's a wonderful. Jerky, being a jerky teenager, he he doesn't know what he's got, so he's kind of looking, looks down his nose at it because he wants to see the big wonderful wild world out there. So, uh, and then when he does actually see the big wide wonderful world, he gets his ass kicked. So he should have he should have known better than to complain about. Tillamook land of cheese, man. The other big thing that happened this week that we wanted to talk about was that there was also a vague composite photo of another black hole that was released just yesterday. Are you referring to episode X? Many machines on X of Star Wars? Star Wars? They're still making those? No, they're making something called Star Wars, however. Yes. I saw the trailer, and because I was emotionally scarred for life by my exposure to The Last Jedi, uh, and suffer from multiple personality disorder because of that film, and all my personalities dislike that film for different reasons, uh, I was not able to, to look at it objectively and fairly the way a true Star Wars fan should. Because I am no longer a Star Wars fan, I'm, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, they... Uh, Ryan Johnson just battered the uh, the love of all things Star Wars out of me. Now, don't get me wrong; I still like the original first three movies, and I'll even give the uh, the prequels a uh, spin because, by contrast, they now seem good compared to compared to what Disney did with it. And I got to tell you, even though it bombed at the box office, the first the first Star Wars bomb, uh, I thought uh, Solo, a Star Wars story, was actually a pretty good heist film. Was actually a pretty good film. If it had come out before Last Jedi, it would have made money. But because it came out afterwards, all the fans who could not legally take their money back after they'd been disappointed retaliated in the only way they could by by standing up Solo, which is why it didn't make any money. I, I yeah. think Solo would have been a great movie not set in the Star Wars universe. Well, that's the usual thing I like about the Star Wars universe. It's actually two or three different universes. The princess lives in a, in a universe where the nobles are intriguing against each other, and there's a senate, and there's an imperium, and so on and so forth. 
Luke lives in a universe where there is sorcery and you know ninja wizardry and the mysterious mystical forces moving. And Han Solo comes from a crime drama. He comes from the the, the mean streets of, of Tatooine. And so Solo takes place in his in his background, in his in his universe, where there's train at robberies and and uh, dames that you can't trust, and so on and so forth. And the other thing that you find in a film noir story. But my, my problem with Solo was that all the things it did to try and connect it to the previous Star Wars films mm -hmm. um, were lame and and annoying to me. Like mm -hmm. where he got his name. Um, the dice thing, the twelve-year-old girl started the rebellion thing. Um, uh, Darth Maul turning out to have really been alive still thing. Um, I, all, I have to I have to give them that because I I also I also like to see Fu Manchu come back again, even though he clearly should have died in the volcano explosion. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm okay with that because that strikes me as pulp. But the other things I agree were annoying, but they weren't so annoying that it took me out of the picture. Does that make sense? Yeah. I would have forgiven. I would have forgiven Solo if it had come out before Last Jedi, but after Last Jedi, I'm just going. This this universe is dead to me now. Well, you, you got to understand that's that's the point I have reached with all of pop culture. It's like I have really stopped caring about the Marvel MCU movies. Whatever they do, I have seen the end from the beginning, and I know from here on out it's going to be disappointment. Um, and so whatever. Because the Marvel MCU movies are the only thing Marvel's doing that I think is still good. Their 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 funny books are terrible. You know, um, the movies, everyone keeps pretending like the movies are all politically correct, but I see very little of that or almost none in the movies. No, no, uh, I, I'm I'm not I'm not worried so that uh, about that so much is that there's sort of I, I don't know if this is normal or not, but it's really sort of mediocre quality uh, stories coming out of each film and it's sort of like we throw all the budget and we have uh, expert professionally crafted garbage it's it's the mcdonald's of films maybe but there was a scene in the last film where thor had to reignite a dead star in a giant space station to get a huge dwarf to help make his new hammer that was broken by the goddess of death i thought that was just way cool I'm easy to please. You, you guys have higher standards than I do. Yeah, well, Thor's Thor's arc in in uh, Avengers. What, what was it called? What do they call that last one? Infinity, whatever. Infinity War. Yeah. 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 Thor's arc was was actually pretty satisfying in that one. Yeah. Um, my point. I absolutely do not think that they're that the Star Wars films have been very PC at all up until now. But the advent of Captain Marvel and their plans for the future. They're going to replace Hawkeye with his daughter. Um, really? Yeah. Oh He's, wow. That might but, be. I did not go see Captain Marvel. I just heard it was. I just heard it was PC garbage. So I didn't. I didn't even try. Um. But all of those things that they're doing are. Uh, that I I know that the Star Wars universe, or excuse me, the MCU is going to fly apart in the very near future. Three years, four years, five years doesn't matter. But the same with Star Trek. The same with basically every single quote unquote franchise in culture, I've, I've just written off because I know that I can see that they either are decaying or will decay in the near future. And so I have put my passion and I have put my caring and I've put my hope in other things. And I'm just, I've done, I've turned off my uh, emotional attachment to modern day what they call geek culture stuff and and that's okay i'm fine i can see the collapses coming and i am going on and doing my own thing we're gonna have to change the name of the podcast then if we're not geeks anymore i gotta tell you one thing though uh uh in order to get my star trek fix these days i either have to show one of my kids part of the original series or i have to watch a show called the orville which yes. even though it's made by a completely hollywood left-wing guy he keeps his politics for the most part out of the out of the storyline, and it's it's a perfectly cromulent Star Trek flavored adventure story. And the the times where his politics do come into the show, at least as far as I've seen, and I've seen all episodes up until the last like three, um, he has put them in the show in such a way that they're not his politics; they're Star Trek's politics. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it, there, it, will usually, it will usually give both sides a, a chance to say something, which is which is the mark of a superior craftsman, because every villain is a hero in his own in his own story in his own mind. You know. I have a deep opinion about that that I don't want to go into on today's show. <laughs> Sorry, I, I've got no comment. I'm not really a, a Star Wars fan. It it would be an ep- it would be three different epic grants chained together, and I just I don't think I'm up to that right now. You you haven't had enough uh, energy today. Well, wh- why don't you uh, yeah? Why don't you knock back some Red Bulls and and let it rip? <laughs> here's, what, here's what I did after the disappointment of the Last Jedi because I actually felt sorry for the actor playing Luke Skywalker because Luke Skywalker is a character who, in the original trilogy, his father was Satan. Okay, I'm sorry, his father was one of the most impressive supervillains since Darth Vader. He has a black skull face. He wears a Nazi helmet and a long black cape. And he sounds like an obscene phone call. Darth Vader, just a great villain. And uh, the, the sudden reveal in the, in the uh, second movie, spoiler warning, that, that uh, he is the son of, uh, he's, uh, he's, Theseus killed his own father. No, wait, excuse me. That he's the son of Darth Vader had almost a Greek tragedy stature to it. It was a great twist, even though it actually didn't make plot-wise that much sense. And having Leia be his sister was really awkward, especially since they had been smooching up in the uh, in the previous film. But but Luke Skywalker was a guy who had hope when everyone else, his all his wise mentors said, there is no hope. This guy is never going to reform. This guy can't be changed. He can't be saved. And he went in and and refused to fight his dad, and he, even though he was under the most immense pressure you could put a, put a character under. And that character is the one who in The Last Jedi, gives up all hope on everything and goes back to the Jedi island to die for no reason in a universe where suddenly accelerating the light speed can be used as a trump card to destroy whole star fleets and was never used before in the history of space warfare and where Leia, with no training, can waft through space with a, uh, like, Mary Poppins and also open a door with no airlock uh, <laughs> into, a, into a fully pressurized ship and uh, on and on and on and on. I was so annoyed that I said, I have to write my own. Someone someone unwisely said, why don't you write your own? I was on a trip with my kids, a long car trip. We had like an hour in the car. And I said, why don't we make up what you guys would have done with Force Awakens and Last Jedi? So we all sat there and, and just shot the breeze and made up a plot, cobbled it together on, on the car trip. I'm talking about children talking for an hour in a car. Came up with a better plot than Disney did, Okay. Pardon me for boasting, but we did. It was it was it, it hung together. It made more sense. It was more exciting. So as a joke, I wrote up a an essay for my blog, pretending that I was a movie reviewer from a parallel dimension where a good Star Wars movie had been made by Disney instead of instead of a piece of garbage. Okay. And at the end of the at the end of the essay, I and I described the make believe film that I pretended I saw. But at the end of the essay, I said, "Don't you wish you were in my in my timeline instead of yours, suckers?" Uh, and enough. Uh, readers of mine said, "Why don't you actually write this up as a, as a novel?" And I said, "Okay, I will. I, I am at your command. I am your servant." So that's my current project that I'm working on now. It's called Star Quest. I'm not trying to hide the origin of it. <laughs> it's, I'm going to try to make it as as space opera flavored as I possibly can. You know, I've been sitting uh, rereading pulp magazines and I've been rewatching the good old serials that George Lucas got his inspiration from. Things like Spy Smasher and uh, Captain America and so on from the from the good old days, and uh, just trying to capture, just trying to learn how to capture some of that pacing, some of that excitement. If you look at Star Wars, if you actually analyze the plot and the plot twists, it's really well put together. It's a well crafted movie. It, it 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 deserves its fame. People tend to overlook it because the special effects are so flashy and so good. But but even without that, even if you heard it as a radio play, it's got it's got uh, everything you want in the story. It's got likable main characters. They go through. They go through understandable character arcs. It's got comedy relief. It's got action. It's got adventure. It's got sacrifice. I mean, it's 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 as big as Tarzan or Sherlock Holmes or Conan the Barbarian for a reason, and it's taken its place among that pantheon. And I'm just sorry that uh, people who wanted to tear down that, you know, that godlike accomplishment because they worshipped another idol <laughs> instead, an idol called political correctness, got their filthy hands on it. Well, I mean, you, you might be you might be right about the original cause, but I want to jump in because I don't think that, I mean, yeah, that, that might be ultimately what's going on, but I think there's a much simpler explanation for it, and, and it 
there's a reason why Disney purchased it. And there's a reason why it, the, the original film, made George Lucas so much money. All the money was from merchandising. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they care about its meaning and purpose as a, a pop culture phenomenon. Mm -hmm. They're simply they're simply commodifying it. The thing is that Disney has a reputation for being some, among the best storytellers in pop culture, and they've had this reputation since since Walt Disney was still alive. They went through a, 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 a dark age, and they had a renaissance. They went through another dark age again, and now we're in the middle of of something worse than a dark age, where the barbarians are actually trying to dismantle and destroy culture. And don't, don't, don't tell me it's merchandise. It's deliberate. If you want to sell merchandise, if you want to sell Rose Tico dolls, then you make Rose Tico an appealing character. And well, no, I good to do. Well, I I, th I think that's the that's the difference between the the business folks at Disney were just come out you know commodifying it, and the problem was is that I think they got the wrong people to execute on it. So I think there's a big difference between like the, the idea. The term execute is very well chosen in that sense. <laughs> I, I will say this. My opinion about The Last Jedi and the rest of Star Wars, I'm not mad at Rian Johnson anymore. I'm not upset or infuriated or anything. I just don't care anymore. And my opinion on him can be summed up in an entirely 100%, 100% professional analysis, which is this. You are a bad storyteller I, I respectfully disagree i saw his movie brick and i thought it was a perfectly good story perfectly well told i saw looper also a good story also perfectly well told now neither of them is a space opera neither of them is optimistic both are dark and gritty i i think this is i i don't think he has a failure of ability i think he has a failure of philosophy i think he wanted to promote certain political and philosophical ideas such as Purple-haired women in, in evening dresses get to slap around uh, uh, young, white, straight males. And that was what drove him to make one absurdly bad decision after another. If you can tell good stories, but you choose not to tell good stories, that makes you a bad storyteller. Because it is your job to tell good stories and serve your audience. I agree, but he, he, he has the talent, but he didn't use it in this case. Right, he's Although, not a talentless he, hack. He's not talentless, but he is a bad storyteller. Correct. He, he, he's bad in the sense of wicked, in the sense of evil. He did not do what he was hired to do. He broke his, his, he broke his overt promise to his bosses, and he broke his unwritten promise to his audience, deliberately, because of a, because of, of, of a political philosophy. And a lot of people in popular culture today, uh, surprising large numbers of them have actually seemed to have lost their talent for one reason or another. Um, but a lot of them can tell good stories. They just choose not to. I have a theory as to why that is. I, I submit to your candid judgment that storytelling is by its nature a conservative effort. It relies on the human nature being a certain way men and women being certain ways that are identifiable and recognizable to the audience. It relies, in effect, on the fundamental premise that human nature doesn't change, even if you're telling a story set in the future or in the past, or in some fairy land that never existed. Even if you're telling a story about robots or aliens, if they don't have recognizable human emotions, then you're not telling a story. And the idea of a plot, of cause and effect, of free will, of human decisions being significant, all those all those thoughts are alien to the mindset of the politically correct. They don't like the idea that actions have consequences. They don't like the idea that hard work gets you gets you any reward that you might get in life. They don't like the idea that women, feminine women are appealing and masculine men are appealing. They don't like the idea that uh, life makes sense and that the moral code of the universe is objectively the case. They don't like the stories that have morals. They don't like anything about what a story is supposed to be stories originally in the in the west at least uh when they when they started moving from being epics to being romances that was kind of in the middle ages late middle ages the word romance comes from rome it was it was basically something about the uh and it, uh, something about the individual nature of the protagonist 
was emphasized in the West that you don't see either in ancient epics or in uh, Oriental in Eastern epics. And the uh, the struggles of the protagonist to overcome external and internal woes and to tie it all together into a uh, <laughs> something like the quest for the Holy Grail that has more than one level to it. Uh, there's a lot of elements there that are that are that are Western culture artifacts, and these the modern mindset, the modern left wing mindset does not like the West, does not like Western culture artifacts, doesn't like personal responsibility, doesn't like individualism, doesn't like morals in stories or moral codes. Uh, they like stories that break those things, that question those things. They think it's they think they think storytelling is meant to, as a, as a piece of social engineering to normalize what is abnormal or to persuade the audience to to change its mind. They think they're educating us, even though they know less than we do. Uh, and so storytelling is not storytelling, real storytelling that grips you, stories that make you laugh, make you cry, make you kiss, you know, 10 bucks goodbye. Those kind of things are anathema to them. They don't like that kind of stuff. What they think a good story is, is uh, Waiting for Godot, is Sartre's No Exit, is is stories where you where you realize that life makes no sense, that you're on your own, that you have to, uh, uh, like Nietzsche, throw aside all bourgeoisie, all middle class conventionality, and and invent your own moral code for yourself. Those are their heroes. Now they can tell a good story about a rebellion or a revolution because they 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 see themselves as great revolutionaries. But any other kind of story is alien to their mindset. They they think life is a cheat. They think that people succeed by cheating, and there's no fairness in life. That everything is just a power struggle between different identity groups, males and females, whites and blacks, gays and straights. So to them, anything that has a hero in it is automatically anathema because there is no hero. There's no there's no guy who either chosen by God or by dint of his own effort uh, or by by dint of superior noble birth gets to be better than anyone else. Because in their worldview, the only way you get better is by cheating. And the only thing a person is supposed to do is to uh, cure that cheating by elevating what is low and, and cutting down anything that is proud and high. Now, as a Christian, I have not, no problem with elevating what is low if, you, if you're talking about the, the, the deserving poor or the people that, that the world oppresses or that bad luck tramples upon. But they regard, since they regard people as not responsible for their actions, they regard even people who are uh, immoral, who have ruined their lives because of their own their own mischances, as victims of society, not victims of their own error. So that that person is not going to be. They don't believe in the the best stories are stories about repentance and forgiveness. Those are the ones that really get it, uh, your heart thumping and bring a tear to your eye. Uh, even even a story as 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 silly and loud and fun as Star Wars. What actually happened with Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker at the end of the of the of the, uh, of the uh, third movie, Return of the Jedi? That was forgiveness. Okay. The left doesn't believe in forgiveness. They believe in Darwinism. They believe that life is a struggle between between the strong and the weak, and you have to help the weak against the strong. And, and they don't think there's anything else to it. They don't think there's a mutual benefit. They don't think that men and women are supposed to love each other. They don't think any of these things. Now, I'm not saying all of them. I'm saying this is the, this is the general philosophy, and they all, no one could believe all this nonsense 100%. They all believe it to some degree. Various different, and they emphasize different parts of it at different times as the as the fashion changes and as the mood strikes them. But in general, we're just talking about the the in the broad overview. They're against the thing that makes storytelling good, so they can't tell good stories because if they do, they're betraying what they believe in. That's my theory. I I don't think you'll find any disagreement here. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's it. If I could, if I could try to sum up in my own in my own thoughts, yeah, it sounds like the that o overall philosophy results in stories that don't do they don't seem true. They don't feel real. You can't you you can't connect with a character or a story that doesn't uh, sort of it, it it doesn't feel like it applies to this reality to this to this world. It just doesn't make sense. It's it's absurd. That's that was one of the things going back to the last Jedi. That was one of the things about all the scenes on the on the bridge, 
with um, Admiral Purple Hair and everything like that. Yeah. It was all it was all absurd. Like even even on your own terms, this setting, this the this set of characters and the way they interact with each other, they don't make sense. Yeah. It's, it's it's completely absurd. And can you imagine taking a great idea for a character like, what if one of the stormtroopers developed a conscience and and defected, and then in the opening of the Last Jedi he wakes up in the hospital bed and does a pratfall on his face, <laughs> yeah, and then gets and then gets zapped by the by the by the monkey uh, by the grease monkey in the in the cargo bay with a with an electronic zapper and he gets knocked on his butt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ridiculous. Actually, I, I do want to give credit to uh, to Abrams or, or whoever wrote that. Whoever wrote that character, or at least the background of that character, I, I mean, there have to has to have been countless stormtroopers over the years who have defected. Uh, so, it, that, that, I mean, that's a great jumping point, jumping off point for a character. Mm -hmm. People in the modern era, uh, not everyone, mind you. I'm talking about a specific subclass of people. So, I guess we could say leftists in the modern era don't understand or appreciate awe they don't understand or appreciate nobility or heroism yes, right. and they are addicted to bathos which is where someone does something noble or great or moving and then you immediately follow it up with a piece of comedy to make them look silly um which can be effective in certain circumstances in limited amounts um, but building a whole culture off of that uh, is a fool's errand. I actually like the way they did that, the, the bathos in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. I thought it worked really well for what they were trying to do with their half-serious, half-overdramatic approach. It was Because it was also space opera. Uh, but you can't... <laughs> uh, but it's dessert. It's not. It can't be a main course. Well, and and Guardians of the Galaxy is a story of a guy who really is a nobody. He's not a superhero. He's a nobody, but he's trying to become a hero. And so Bathos is appropriate because all of his overly dramatic statements about how badass he is are actually kind of ridiculous in that movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in that movie, I'm sorry. I really like those guys. He he does it. He carries it off, and it's charming. Oh yeah, he actually turns out to be the son of a supernatural being. Spoiler warning in the second movie. You know, I, I really like uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. But if you, let's say you had a conventional three movie trilogy arc, uh -huh. then you would have to start getting rid of Bathos for the most part in the second one, and then completely get rid of it in the third one, where he gets to be, you know, like Luke Skywalker was in Return of the Jedi, which is powerful confident, assured, who really can do and really can inspire the emotions in others that he only wants to in the first movie but can't. That's, that's actually a really good point. And I'll point out something I just saw on a review. Oddly enough, it was called The Last Straw, which is the same name I gave my review of Last Jedi, talking about Bathos, talking about this very point you're talking about, where he pointed out that the humor in Empire Strikes Back, which is a little darker than Star Wars, was all character based. It was all it was all the humor of people under stress, kind of sniping at each other or or being witty. Uh, you know, I'd rather kiss a Wookiee. I can arrange that. I mean, good lines that that showed you uh, that also were a bit of character development. But it was not things like in the in the uh, in the prequels, the humor was more like Jar Jar Binks, if that's his name, steps in poo or he gets his tongue stuck in a in an engine or, or just things that were just that were just step and fetch it style comedy but without the brilliant hard work of the real step and fetch it who actually was a pretty funny comedian back in the day did physical comedy did did slapstick comedy um slapstick and and epic don't really don't really mix if a guy is trying to become epic which i think he which and i'll agree with you which i think is going on in guardians of the galaxy Star Lord wants to be Star Lord, and and it's like Kapu says, "Well, it's not that weird to have a to have a code name when it actually is, you know." I'm Star Lord. Who? It's hilarious. That's actually that's actually funny because he's like Don Quixote. 
he's a guy who's not a knight. He wants to be a knight. He wants to live up to the high standard. And if you do that and you believe in the high standard, that can be really actually powerful, especially if the guy does actually live up to it and, and undergoes the training and the suffering he needs to get what he wants. But if you're a postmodern leftist, and not again, not all leftists, but just ones of a certain philosophy and mindset. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off there for just half a second. Uh, because I've got something that dovetails perfectly with what, you, what you're saying. You, uh, you're pointing out that if he went through all the strife and trouble that he needed to, to earn his impressive stature, then that would be a satisfying story arc. It, and I agree with you. That was you know my original thesis. But Luke did go through all the strife and suffering and progressed and earned it. But in this new trailer, the second black hole, um, Ray is presented as being this badass force user, oh, but she never earned it. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. She is the textbook definition of a Mary Sue. And a, a Mary Sue is a self-insert character who uh, everyone is awed by, uh, that she has her own copy of the Holy Grail, even if you've already established in the canon that someone else has the Holy Grail. She usually has purple hair, but not always. She Everyone's impressed with her. Everyone likes her. Uh, if she has some suffering in the past, it doesn't really have much effect on her character. For example, if you were banned as a child, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I'm the son of an orphan, and, and my dad was raised. He was, he was a pretty hardcore guy because of that. And I didn't see any of that personality trait in uh, uh, Mary Sue. She didn't receive any training at the hands of Luke Skywalker in the. I'm not going to call him that. I'm sorry. He was he was Mopey Skywiner in the in the uh, in the last the last Jedi. Uh, Mopey doesn't train her. She confronts the dark side, but is untemptable. What's her What's her character arc? She starts out awesome and ends up awesome. She's she's nice to robots, and and rude to the stormtroopers trying to save her. Uh, and she can do everything. She can. She can hypnotize a stormtrooper to releasing her from jail. She can escape by herself. Let's compare it to Le let's compare it to Leia. Leia is feisty and actually insults the Grand Moff Tarkin, the, one of her first lines in the film. And then they blow up her whole planet. They kill everyone she knows. They kill her family. They kill everyone she knows. And she doesn't. She doesn't break. They torture her. She doesn't crack. But she needs help escaping. She doesn't escape by herself. She doesn't fight the entire rebellion by herself. And when in in, uh, in Empire Strikes Back, she goes and talks as a princess should to the uh, to the soldiers and the airmen who are fighting the battle, and she answers their questions. And she tells them what the plan is. <laughs> I'm sorry, my my dad was in the military. The idea that the CO would not <laughs> would not tell you the plan. Uh, if if you if there's a spy among you, or if you're worried about security, that's a different thing. Okay, that's legit. But they don't even tell you what. Uh, Last Jedi was a sinkhole. It was so bad that they're not going to get a dime out of me for this new film. I have no interest in it. The, the trailer just looked terrible. The trailer starts with with Mary Sue with her stolen lightsaber that doesn't even belong to her. That she's not trained with, and she's going to beat up an a, 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 a an aircraft, a warship. <laughs> she's going to take on a a speeding aircraft with her hand weapon. Come on. Come on. And then the voiceover is the ghost of Luke saying, uh, there's thousands of, uh, of generations of Jedi, and you're the culmination of it all. We have nothing more to teach you. You're now just perfect in every way. You know, look, sorry. I, I, if there was a guy who was perfect in every way, he would cure the sick and raise the dead, and they'd crucify him. <laughs> and they wouldn't, they wouldn't just, everyone would not be so awed and impressed with him. Because some people would hate him, because that's what you do with people who are perfect in every way. Or they go to the bank's house and help raise their bratty kids, because because Mary Poppins is not a Mary Sue, and she is practically perfect in every way. So thank you very much. Uh, the thing I love about Le Leia's arc, or Leia's character in uh, Star Wars, is that she makes a big mistake and almost gets them all killed. Um. She's the one who blasts a hole in the floor and sends them down a random chute and lands them in the trash compactor. And they have to be saved by C-3PO. <laughs> All, all's fair, though. She also, saved, she also, in doing that, saved them from 
getting yeah. gender the stormtroopers who were coming into the coming into the jail cell. I'm, so, just, I'm just saying she wasn't perfect. But she wasn't perfect. No, no. And it was really sweet when she gave Luke a kiss for luck and they swung on that line across the abyss and that was just like a scene out of an Errol Flynn movie, which which Star Wars is basically nostalgic. It's harkening back to the to the chapter plays of and the pulp novels of of uh, you know America in, in the forties, and a modern Mary Sue would never do that. Women don't like men, not if they're modern women. They don't appreciate strong men. They don't want them to, They want to be saved. They resent it. Now, can you imagine trying to tell a story about a woman who's resentful of being rescued when when you got to save her from the Empire? What's What's the point of that? I, I mean, yeah. why, why tell that story? It, uh, are women supposed to like that story? Or are men supposed to like that story? My my new opinion on like Star Trek Discovery and The Last Jedi and whole vast swaths of the culture is just looking at what they've done and saying, this is bad craft. This is poorly done storytelling. Well, and, you and I have a disagreement about only of terminology. It is poorly done, but it's being poorly done on purpose. It's not that the craftsmen, it's not that they lack the ability to, to, to do the craft. They lack the will to do it. They, they're trying to use their skills to do the opposite of telling a story. They're trying to socially engineer your brain. I'm a servant of my readers, okay? They're my boss. I work for them. These guys regard themselves as the masters, as the teachers of their readers, of their viewers. And they think their job is to, is to change our minds about things they think are important rather than just to entertain me for entertainment's sake and maybe throw in a little bit of interesting tidbits of education here and there. Why not? I, I learned everything I know about, uh, you know, astronomy from reading science fiction stories, but those are, those are well-crafted science fiction stories that put real science into, into them. You know, I, I think part, I think part of it is, and I'm not sure what, how much, how much this is an influence, but they don't see their audience as the customers, the, the people buying the tickets, the people yeah. reading the stories. Yeah. Uh, they are, it's, it's a form of virtue signaling. Uh, social media is, is a, is a huge factor here. They're doing it for good boy points. They're, they're doing it for the praise from their bosses, from their um, donors, from the, you know, the, the woke public on, on social media, you could even, I mean, you could even flip it around. You could even imagine a world where it were reversed, where, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, good boy, right wing uh, pats on the head, that sort of thing. Right. You know, you, you can picture a world where all the message fic is, you know, for example, uh, everything's, everything's like a, a Christian message fic or something like that. Right. Those really, the those really heavy-handed Christian films that come out that you're like, yeah, I mean, I I, I might I might believe, but I I really don't want to watch the uh, I don't want to be preached at all day. So they're preaching and 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 they're they're virtue signaling and they're doing it for the good boy points. They're not doing it for but even in, for, even for the love of the craft. But even in the, in the spiritual where it's flipped, and don't get me wrong, there's always been Aesop's fables. There's always been stories that had a moral point to them. In fact, some of the best stories in the world have, have points to that. Uh, in the stories like uh, Starship Troopers, which is basically a lecture about civic virtue, about military virtue, dressed up in a story garb, okay? And don't get me wrong, I like that story just fine. I like it as a lecture, but <laughs> I like it as a story. As a story, it doesn't really hang together that much. There's no, there's no real character arc for the main character, except for maybe the boot camp. I mean, yeah. but there I'm going to, elect to see a lecture. I'm going to read a lecture. If you read Ayn Rand, you're going to read. You're going to see a lecture. You're not going to be, you know, uh, entertained as, as, a, as a movie. Uh, but all that aside, if if you're reading Aesop Fable and the moral of the story is little boys shouldn't tell lies because if you do, you'll be eaten by a wolf. Okay, that's different from going to a story where the moral of the story is uh, the only judgment you should make is never to make judgments. The only truth is there's no truth. The only the only uh, the only good thing that white men have ever done is is gotten out of the way because white men are evil because race white men are evil because racism is evil and white men are racist so all therefore that race is bad uh those morals are actually immoral those are those are teaching the opposite of morality they're they're divorced from reality they're all absurd they're all unreal you know if if, if i saw a very preachy military film starring john wayne john wayne and starship troopers and and he was telling the young men that they had to be brave and they had to put their they had to stand between their beloved homes and war's desolation. 
that even if it was badly done, even if it was heavy handed, the moral would still be a good moral. Okay, but if if the if the moral of the story is life is absurd and you're a bad guy, you you the audience, you're you're racist, you're evil. Uh, that's that's not a good moral. It's not a good story, and you can't make a good story with that as your skeleton. See, that's why that's why I think all these things. I mean, it's not. I don't think it's coincidence that all of these franchises all of these things are just being destroyed the this kind of writing can't make a new story out of nothing the way a, a creative person can all they can do is take an established character turn him into a female turn him turn him into a minority turn him into the opposite of what he is make him into luke skywiner instead of luke skywalker denigrate desecrate and tear down the the things that the that the uh, uh, the anti writers regard as false, but they can't actually build anything up new. You see, and all our complaints, please notice, we're all talking about well established, sometimes fifty year old franchises. You know, when did Marvel Comics get started? A long time ago. Uh, and we're not talking about oh that great new story that everyone's talking about that that. Is really wonderful and now is 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 completely politically correct because that's not what political correctness does it doesn't it, it's it, it's like uh uh sauron in lord of the rings the bad guys can't actually uh make anything morgoth the sauron's boss can't make elves he can't make life but he can turn them into he can turn them into orcs the ring can't create more life but it can turn uh, a hobbit into a golem that's that's them um, we are, we got about eight minutes left in the show because you have a rigid hard deadline coming up and I yeah. want to respect your time. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question. <laughs> um, it's, a, I didn't get to talk about Star Quest, my, my great new, uh, idea for a Star Wars novel. Yeah, but that was your choice. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to feel guilty about that. I refuse. Um, I, I had a question. You had a recent guilty, but this was this was all actually about StarQuest. This is what's motivating me. Is I, uh, I, I think our culture deserves pulp. I think we deserve space opera. I think we deserve heroes. I think we deserve action and adventure and stories that will make you cry, stories that will make you laugh, and stories that will make you cheer. That's what I. That's what my goal is. That's what my ambition is. The Hello, original here. definition of romance wasn't male and female attraction and hooking up. Uh, it was. Um, the glamour of adventure and striving and battle. Mm -hmm. um, it was about the allure, stories about those things. And this is where people get it all wrong. They weren't saying, uh, the, the stories weren't necessarily saying, oh yes, going out and killing other human beings is awesome and, and stuff. But they were instructing uh, they weren't deliberately didactically teaching. They were stories about heroes and heroism, which would inspire people um, to be more noble in their daily life. Yeah. Even if you never stepped on the field of battle, um, if you bought into or believed in the virtue of nobility and the virtue of honor, the virtue of the strong standing up for the weak, the virtue of self-sacrifice, the virtue of holding back on your strength so that uh, you could protect weak people instead of using weak people. All of these things were embedded in romance and scientific romance. Let me interrupt to, to, add, to add a, uh, a historical point. If you've read ancient literature, if you've read uh, Homer and Virgil, and other other writings of the of the of our pagan past, as admirable as they are, and I'm a big fan of the pagans. Don't get me wrong. I think I think I mean Socrates, great guy. But the idea that the weak had a special glamour to them that made it so the strong should protect them, that the poor should be honored even above the rich, and that the rich had something shady about them that made it so that they. Uh, they couldn't get into the into the kingdom of heaven any more than you could fit a camel through the eye of a needle. That kind of thinking, that comes out of Christianity, and you see that in the medieval romances, in the chansons, in the stories of, you know, Lancelot, who is the bravest knight in the hall in, in the field, is also the gentlest man in the hall when the ladies are around. 
uh, that kind of uh, deferential paradox of strength used for right, not strength makes right, as as they as they say in in the movie Camelot. Oh, uh, that's new. That's not that's not in ancient literature. That's right. that's romances, and I think I think you have correctly put your finger right on what was at the heart of romance, which was chivalry, which was nobility, which was which was even acknowledging that your enemy might be your brother, that kind of thing. It, and it was see that in the modern postmodern mindset, because to them, they never accept an apology. If you apologize to them, you're, you're, they, they regard that as a, as a confession of guilt. They never forgive. They never forget. You know, they have no they have no chivalry to them. To them, chivalrous man is a guy who's who's a weak one who's going to be taken advantage of by their strong feminist women who, you know, uh, they, they're barbarians. The, the civilization that, that sprang out of the, the, uh, the Roman Empire, the, the European civilization, regarded things like rule of law and uh, concern for all, the equality of all, even if they had a hierarchical society, they thought all men were equal in the eye of God. They didn't think that a peasant's life was worth nothing. That you know, that a samurai could just practice with his sword on a on a wandering serf. Serfs had property rights, and some serfs were richer than the nobles in the in the Middle Ages. And we and, and all the rights that are enshrined in the American Constitution are carried over from that from that basic worldview. And that's where romance comes from. That's where the modern, the scientific romance that, that's turned into science fiction and fantasy comes from. That's where space opera comes from. So I, that's my historical note. I believe that what people truly want in their hearts are aspirational stories of heroism. Um, and that real heroism very often is dirty and painful and long and grueling and not all that amenable to being in a cool story. But by telling stories of heroism and aspirationalism, um, you make it possible for people to believe in themselves believe that they can be nobler and finer and and believe in something bigger than themselves that's an important point yeah I'm sure, mary, I'm sure mary sue believes in herself but i was just rereading the early spider-man the steve ditko spider-mans to my kids boy does that boy suffer boy his life sucks boy he's got girl troubles <laughs> his life um, is terrible and he's a hero because he keeps pushing through Keep, keep, keeping on. They believe that they can be better, that they are who they are, but they can be better. That's yeah. what yeah. that's what the original term of romance refers to. Well, and right. so um I believe yeah. that having stories like that around are fun, they're entertaining, they're engaging, and they are moving. Even more than just entertaining, they are moving. They give people something to care about because whether they know it or not, whether they realize it or not, the story is speaking to the best part of them and it helps them be better than they are by just making them believe that it's possible, that they're not trapped by circumstances to be uh, everyday, average, and ordinary, that anyone can be noble and virtuous and aspire to more not in terms of money not in terms of property not in terms of fame but aspire to be a finer person and lift up everybody around you that's why the stories are valuable i gotta say amen and yay brother because i believe that the poets as someone once said are the secret legislators of the world you will know the spirit of a culture you know the spirit of a civilization if you look at the stories that tell itself about itself and if those stories are noble and uplifting, then the culture, the whole society, is going to be pointed in a nobler direction. And if they're all stories about victims and victimology and whining, then the whole story, the whole civilization is going to be a, a passel of whiny brats that that don't like each other very much, and and they have nothing else to do but protest each other and hate each other. And it, the choice is actually pretty clear. Our our society is at a crossroads. So we have to decide whether we want to have romance in our life or we want to have absurdity. That's a great choice. Well, I, we're just about out of time. Uh, Mr. Wright, thanks for, for joining us for today. Do you have any last words for us? Yes, I'm uh, hard at work on StarQuest. Please support me. 
And when it comes out, I hope it will be a very, I hope it will be pleasing to my readers and to everyone who feels like I do that uh, Star Wars should have uh, grown rather than shrunk, should have turned into something noble and something great. Cool. Uh, yeah, be, I'll be sure to check that out. I've got your website listed in the show notes. If there's any other links that we should have, please send them to uh, me or Daddy Warpig after the show. And, and everybody viewing this on YouTube will be able to get those links. Very good. Very good. Uh, for my part, uh, uh, thanks thanks for coming on. Thanks for Daddy Warpig for being an awesome uh, host. Thanks to everybody in the chat for hanging out. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I likewise would like to... Th- Express uh, much gracious thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Wright for coming on the show. He did it at the last minute. Um, I sent him an email and said, hey, you know, would you like to come on the show on Saturday? And he agreed. And it was very, very gracious of him to take out uh, an hour out of a Saturday to come in and talk to us all. Uh, enjoyed the conversation immensely. I enjoyed all the I, – I didn't mention a lot of it on the air, but I was reading the chat. So I read everybody's comments in the chat while we were on the air. Uh, we had some old friends show up. Um, and so uh, – uh, people I haven't, you know, talking to in a long time showed up in the chat, so that was cool. And I want to thank everybody who came and uh, oh. participated in the chat. And I want to wish everyone a happy Easter. It's uh, he's risen. It's uh, just next week, isn't it? Or is it two weeks from now? I've lost track of all time. Next, next Sunday, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Next Sunday. Yep. Um, and uh, also happy Easter from me. Um, and. I want to remind people that you can listen to Geek Gab on YouTube.com slash Geek Gab. Uh, or if you are morally opposed to YouTube, you can also listen to Geek Gab on SoundCloud.com. You can subscribe to it on the iTunes Store, and you can subscribe to it on the Google Play Store. All you have to do is do a search for Geek Gab, and it will all be available to you the vast wealth of knowledge and awesomeness that is this show will be available to you at no charge um and we invite everybody who's listened to the show for the first time to uh, go check out some of our past shows we've had some really really great ones um and so unfortunately our time is up and we do have to go um but don't you worry don't you fret we will be back